Humans are an incredibly complex animal. Each of us has over 20,000 genes, tens of billions of neurons, and over 37 trillion cells. With that said, the question is, how did we get here? Let's explore how humans evolved on Earth, starting with the most basic form of life to exist. How did life on Earth begin? To answer this question, we need to start about 4 billion years ago, when the first thing to ever live was just beginning to form, and explain what the first form of life was made of, and how the ingredients that made it came together. The first component of the earliest life form is lipids. You're probably familiar with lipids as being fats called triglycerides or cholesterol, but the kinds of lipids that made up early life are a different subgroup called fatty acids. The really amazing thing about these lipids is that they are amphiphiles, meaning they are molecules made up of a hydrophilic or water-attracting head and a hydrophobic or water-repelling tail. What is so great about that? Well, it means that these lipids had the ability to naturally arrange themselves into sphere-shaped groupings of other lipids and form a protective casing called a lipid bilayer. Encased inside the lipid bilayer were amino acids and nucleotides, the molecules that make up RNA, DNA's single helix cousin. These spheres of lipids containing the ingredients for RNA are called protocells, or protobionts, and were most likely formed in hydrothermal vents, fissures in the ocean floor that emit heated water and materials. Protocells are the first and most basic form of life on Earth, and we call one of them LUCA, or the last universal common ancestor, because every living thing is descended from it. So we know what LUCA was made of and how those ingredients came together, but that's not enough for it to be alive. It also needed to be able to self-replicate. Fortunately, the means to self-replicate already exist within the protocell. The trick is the RNA. You see, the nucleotides that make up RNA can arrange themselves in different patterns, creating differently shaped strands. Any of the four types of nucleotide in RNA can attach to any other nucleotide, but the secret to RNA's ability to self-replicate is that the bases of the nucleotides have only one type of nucleotide they can attach to. This is called base pairing. When chains of nucleotides base pair with each other and then split apart, that is how RNA self-replicates. Over the next billion years, random mutations within the nucleotides of replicated RNA would drive the increasing complexity of RNA chains through what is called chemical evolution. Strains of RNA that were more successful at resisting entropy, or more simply, better at self-replicating and not falling apart, survived and were able to spread their genetic information and over the next billion years, evolved the complexity required for unicellular life. Okay, that was a lot to take in, but now that we know what was the earliest form of life, we can explore how that life form evolved and branched to become the abundant biodiversity of species that we know today. The first branch on the tree of life happened 2 billion years ago, with the divide between bacteria and the branch that included archaea and eukaryota. The bacteria and archaea which are both prokaryotic, are topics for different videos. For now, let's explore the lineages of the eukaryotes, the branch on the tree of life that contains plants, animals, slime molds, fungi, and protozoa. The domain eukaryota, or eukarya, is distinct from its ancestor Leuca, in that the organisms in this group's cells have a nucleus containing DNA within its lipid bilayer, instead of just RNA and proteins. There is some debate whether DNA first formed around the same time as RNA, or if it appeared around half a billion years later. But either way, organisms that self-replicate through DNA evolved after organisms that self-replicated through RNA. There are also other characteristics of eukaryotes that make them much more complex than their prokaryote ancestor, so many steps in chemical evolution must have occurred in those 2 billion years. There would be several branches occurring between 1.4 and 2 billion years ago when the eukaryotes diverged, branching into diphoda or the biconts, which became land plants and algae, and Podiata, which includes things such as animals, protists, and fungi. Podiata then branched into crumbs, a clade containing protozoa such as Collodictionidae and Mantamonatidae, and Uniconta, or Amorphia. 1.4 billion years ago, Uniconta split, separating the Amoebozoa from its sister clade, Obozoa. Then 1.3 billion years ago, Obozoa split to include Breviatia, Apisomonatia, and the clade Opisthocanta. The opisthoconts belong to the clade of life that includes animals, fungi, and cholanoflagellates. Then, one billion years ago, it split into holomycota, which is the clade containing fungi, 
and Holozoa, which is the clade containing animals and their single-celled cousins. Phylozoa split from Holozoa 782 to 900 million years ago. Then Phylozoa split into Philisteria and Coanozoa. And then Coanozoa split into Coanoflagellata and Metazoa, or Animalia, meaning every life form in the next video will be an animal. In part two, we will explore the lineage of the first animal all the way up the tree of life to modern humans, and find out how we are related to some other animals along the way. There are quite a few more stages of life to cover in the next episode than in this one, but that should be easier to digest than the ancestors of plants, animals, and fungi, so don't feel overwhelmed to part one is a lot to take in. Be sure to check out part two to see how humans evolved, and subscribe so you don't miss out future videos on the evolution of different animals too. Until next time, see ya! In the last video, we learned how the first single-celled organisms came into existence, and explored the branches of the evolutionary tree from the ancestor of eukaryotes to the first animals. Now let's find out how these first animals evolved to become the only living member of the genus Homo, Homo sapiens. I know I breezed through the lineage of eukaryota to metazoa pretty quickly, but now that we're at the ancestor of all animals, we can slow things down and really examine how these organisms diverged over the next 760 million years. First off, we should figure out what these first animals would have looked like. The common ancestor of all animals was multicellular, but still had a goopy, malleable form like other eukaryotes such as amoebozoa and the ancestor of plants. To know more about exactly what this animal looked like though, we have to look at two of its earliest offshoots, the sponges and the comb jellies. It is highly debated whether Periphera, the sponges, or Tinophora, the comb jellies, were the first to diverge, but in the phylogenetic tree used in this video, I'm placing the divergence of comb jellies after the divergence of sponges. Whether one split from the first animal before or after the other though, we can infer that the first animal shared certain traits found in both sponges and comb jellies. This is difficult to picture, as sponges and comb jellies are incredibly different from each other. In fact, it's hard to even say if the first animal had nerves like comb jellies, or if it lacked nerves like sponges and nerves just happened to evolve twice, or that sponges lost their nervous system over time. Now before I move on, I should mention that the Placozoan Dickinsonia, which is thought to be a sister clade to Eumetazoa and Periphera, is in more recent years looking more likely to be the true first branch of animals, which is interesting because Dickinsonia possesses traits such as a symmetrical body, which wouldn't really be commonly seen for another 200 million years or so. To keep things simple though, I'm going to leave the phylogenetic tree as it is and move on to Eumetazoa. Eumetazoa, or the Diploblasts, split from Metazoa 700 million years ago, and branching off from Eumetazoa were Tinophora, the comb jellies. The sister to Tinophora, Parahoxozoa, split from the Diploblast 680 million years ago, and then branched into Placozoa, which are very simple animals, and Planulozoa. Planulozoa is a really interesting clade because it is at this point that 560 million years ago, a major branch in animals occurred. On one side is Nadaria, the phylum that includes coral, jellyfish, and sea anemones. The other side is Bilateria, the clade that includes everything else, and is characterized by the feature of bilateral symmetry, for the most part meaning that these animals had a clear front end and a back end. Bilaterians also had a coelom, a body cavity containing a digestive tract and other organs. Most early bilaterians had a gut that ran all the way through the body, but others had a bag gut with only one opening, meaning its waste came out the same hole its food went in. Other characteristics of the first bilaterian are up for debate, such as whether it was microscopic or macroscopic. We do know the first bilaterian, which we call Urbilatarian, had a mouth and simple eyes near the front of its body, but beyond that it's unknown how complex this animal was. It may have possessed a brain and a central nervous system, a segmented body, a complete digestive tract, and additional sensory appendages, or it may have had a blobby, non-segmented body, a bad gut, and lacked a central nervous system, or it may have been somewhere in the middle. After the appearance of bilaterians, there was another split, separating the phylums Proarticulata and Xenocelomorpha, which includes achilles and other worms, and the clade Nephrozoa. Nephrozoa is also a major branching point, because it split off into Deuterostomia and Protostomia, the ancestor of mollusks, arthropods, and annelids. The earliest known Deuterostome is called Saccharhytus, and it looks like a living nightmare. Anyway, around 540 million years ago, Deuterostomia branched into Chordata and Ambulocraria, 
which includes Akina dermata, the starfish, sea urchins, sand dollars, and sea cucumbers, and Hemochordata, which contains egghorn worms. Before we see how chordata branch into the cephalochordates and the olfactors, let's take a look at their body plan and see how these animals differ from their bilaterian ancestors. The defining features of chordates is that they possess a notochord, a dorsal nerve cord, pharyngeal slits, and a tail. The cephalochordates include an animal called a lancelet, while the olfactors include the tunicates and the first vertebrates. Now it took a long ways to get here, but after separating ourselves from the likes of amoebas, sponges, jellyfish, and corals, we can talk about the backbone having animals, the animals that make up the vast majority of all chordates. These first vertebrates had a well-defined head and tail, and even somewhat resembled modern fish at a glance, though they lacked features such as a jaw. That would change though, because 462 million years ago, vertebrate is split to include the jawless fish Anatha or the Silostomes, hagfish and lampreys, and Nathostomata, the jawed vertebrates. Here's an interesting one. Branching from Nathostomata are the chondrichthys, or cartilaginous fishes, such as sharks, rays, skates, sawfish, and chimeras. We'll definitely be looking at these animals in more detail sometime soon. We didn't evolve from them though, but instead of the Astichthys or Eutilostomi, the superclass of fishes that contains more than 90% of vertebrates that are alive today. 420 million years ago, Astichthys branched into Cercopteigi and Actinopteigi. Actinopterigi are the ray-finned fishes, which include animals like tuna, salmon, seahorses, mahi-mahi, and anglerfish. The sister to ray-finned fishes are Cercopteigi, the lobe-finned fish. Sarcopterigi branched to include Actinistia, the coelacanths, and Ripidistia, which was formerly called Dipnotetropodomorpha. Ripidistria branched to include Tetrapodomorphs and Dipnomorphs, the lungfish. Tetrapodomorpha branched to separate Eotetrapodiforms from extinct lobe-finned fish, including Megalithiidae and Osteolipidae. Then the Eotetrapodiforms branched to separate the Elpistostegalians from extinct lobe-finned fish, including Platycephalicathus. Elpistostegalia then branched to separate Stegocephalia from the extinct lobefin fish Pandorichthys. Next, Stegocephalia branched to separate tetrapods from extinct lobefin fish, including Elgineropaton, Wachiridae, Holostidae, Ichthyostega, Prasigirhinus, and Buffetidae. Okay, I'm finally done talking about long dead fish now. That was a lot of fish, but we finally reached the tetrapods, the first four limbed animals. Of course, the fishes up to this point all had gills, but for members of Tetrapoda to put their limbs to work, they had to be able to breathe air. Early tetrapods still had gills, but they also had an opening called a spiracle, which evolved as a swim bladder and was eventually repurposed as the basis for lungs. As these fish took their first steps in shallow water, they developed neck vertebrae and other features that would later make them look more like land animals than fish. These early tetrapods adapted to life in shallow waters would branch around 350 million years ago to include amniotes, animals adapted to lay eggs on land, and anamniotes, animals adapted to lay eggs in water, which includes amphibians like frogs and salamanders. The land egg layers amniota split to include synapsids and sorbsida, which includes reptiles like turtles, snakes, crocodiles, dinosaurs, and birds, and an extinct clade called parareptilia. The synapsids which split from amniotes 308 to 312 million years ago are what are known as proto-mammals. They are defined by the temporal fenestra, which is an opening in the skull behind the eyes, and teeth that are differentiated into canines, molars, and incisors. Early synapsids had scaly skin similar to that of a turtle or crocodile, and they laid eggs, but they were warm-blooded and may have had some form of hair. Synapsidia branched to include the Cecciosauria, late Carboniferous and Permian synapsids like Eutheridae and Cassiidae, and the Eupelicosaurs. Eupelicosauria includes Therapsids and Pelicosaurs like Veronopidae and Ophiocodontidae. 275 million years ago, proto-mammals developed limbs oriented beneath the body rather than splayed out like in lizards in the clade Therapsida. Therapsids include Eutherapsida, Tetraceratops, and Biarmasuchia. Eutherapsida branched to include the Neotherapsids and Dinocephalia. Then Neotherapsida branched to include Anomodonts, which were the dominant terrestrial herbivores at the time, and the Theriodonts. Interestingly, Theriodontia includes Eutheriodontians as well as Gorgonopsians, which were apex predators such as Gorgonops and Soroctonus. 
Eutheriodontia includes the Cynodonts and Therosophalians, nicknamed the Beast Heads, and includes species like Presteronathus and Moscarhinus kachingi. Cynodontia branched to include Epicynodontia and several extinct therapsids such as Terrasonathus and Trithelodontids. Epicynodontia branched to include Eucynodontians, Gallosaurids, and Thernaxodontids. And then Eucynodontia branched to include Mammalia forms, Cynonathians, Trithelodontids, Brazilodontids, and Tritliodontids. So, here we are at the home stretch. No more worms, no more fish, no more mammal like reptiles. At 220 million years ago, we have reached Mammalia, the class of mammary gland having animals which branched 160 million years ago to separate the Therians from the monotremes, which became platypuses and echidna. Therians split into Eutherians and Metatherians, the marsupial relatives, 125 million years ago. Marsupials include animals like kangaroos, possums, bandicoots, and Tasmanian devils. Eutheria, also called placentalia, are placental mammals, and branched to separate Boreo-Eutherians from Atlantogenata, which includes many animals such as aardvarks, tenrecs, hyraxes, elephants, dugongs, manatees, anteaters, armadillos, and sloths. Boreo-Eutheria branched 80 to 100 million years ago to separate Euarchontogliers from the Lorisiotherians, a huge clade that includes animals like hedgehogs, moles, bats, ungulates, whales, pangolins, bears, cats, and dogs. Euarchontogliers is the superorder that includes lagomorphs, tree shrews, colugos, and primates. It branched into Euarchonta and the gliaforms, which includes rodents, rabbits, and pikas. Euarchonta includes scandentians, the tree shrews, and the primatomorphs, which include primates and dermoptera, or colugos. 79 million years ago, the order of primates was separated from colugos. Primates include both Haplerheni and Strepsorheni, which includes lemurs and lorises. Haplerheni split 63 million years ago and includes simiaforms and tarsiers. Simiaforms include Caterheni and Platterheni, the New World monkeys. And 35 million years ago, Caterheni branched from simiaforms and includes Hominoidea and Sarcopithecoidea, the Old World monkeys. Now we've arrived at the superfamily Hominoidea, the apes. Hominoidea split 25 million years ago and includes Hominidae and Hylobatidae, the gibbons. Hominidae, the great apes, branched 14 million years ago and includes Homininae and Ponginae, the orangutans. 12.5 to 14 million years ago, the African apes Homininae branched from Hominidae and includes Hominini and Gorillini, the gorillas. Hominini branched from Hominini 7 million years ago and includes humans and pan, chimpanzees and bonobos. Now, at 2 million years ago, we've reached our closest relatives in the genus Homo. Hominina includes all human species, such as Homo habilis, Homo neanderthalensis, and Australopithecus africanus. Now that just leaves us. Around 350,000 years ago, Homo sapiens split from our human ancestors and are the only species of human that are still alive today. That concludes our 4 billion year journey from the first form of life to modern humans, and that's just the beginning. We could spend a whole nother video exploring the relationship between different species of humans, and we will learn about the evolution of all kinds of different animals. For now though, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss future videos. Until next time, see ya.